Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to my presentation. Uh, today, I would like to talk about a deal that was made around one year ago at 5 a.m. on Sunday morning. And that Sunday morning was actually the end of our uh, summer party at Spotify. And this was the company-wide party when all Spotifyers from all over the world has been invited to Stockholm to spend a weekend together and celebrate. And the deal that I would like to talk about was made between Martin Lorenzon, who organized that party, and me. Martin Lorenzon is actually uh, the co-founder of Spotify and our chairman. On the other hand, I'm just data engineer who works uh, with uh, our Hadoop cluster. And the deal that we made says that Martin will invite me and my favorite Swedish artist for a beer or Coke or whatever to drink, only if I prove somehow that I'm the biggest fan of this artist in my home country. And the artist that I would like to drink with is called Timbaktu, and he's actually top Swedish rap and reggae artist. And uh, his song that I like the most is, uh, is titled that everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. And for me, it's the same as everyone wants to have a secure Hadoop cluster, but nobody wants to deploy Kerberos. <laughs> and uh, actually, my friends, my colleagues at Spotify, now you, know about this deal, but Timbaktu still doesn't know anything that is a part of the deal of between me and Martin Lorenzon. And when making our deal at 5 a.m., it was, it was too late to specify how we measure officially that I'm the biggest fan of Timbaktu. However, finding a good metric is not, not so difficult because almost everyone on that world uses Spotify. So it's safely to assume that uh, probably the biggest fan of a given artist is a Spotify user who streams that artist the most frequently. And I think that Martin Lorenzon and Timbaktu will definitely agree with this definition. And I also like this metric because it gives a data-driven answer uh, to my question. And to find this question, I will implement Hive query that will process our production data sets uh, to discover who is the biggest fan of Timbaktu in Poland. And my Hive query is not supposed to be an average Hive query because I would like to implement it as perfectly as possible. And I will follow a couple of uh, tips and best practices related to testing, sampling, troubleshooting, optimizing, and executing the Hive query. And I would like to share how I solved a couple of problems related to them uh, during this presentation. And the additional requirement specified by me is that the time needed to run this Hive query should be shorter than my potential meeting with Timbaktu. And the idea is here that I will rerun that query during our potential drinking session to prove that I'm really the biggest Polish fan of Timbaktu. And to make my query super fast, I will take advantage of many new, newly added features to, uh, to Hive that are join optimizations, org file format, tests, and others. And I will explain how they contributed to a big performance gains that I achieved. But before that happened, let's talk briefly about data sets that I need to process. And basically, I need to take three tables, join them together, and run some simple aggregations. Those tables are called uh, stream, track, and user, and I will describe them briefly. The stream table is uh, the largest table that, we, uh, that I have, and it contains information about all songs streamed by all our users at any point of time. And it has uh, more than 50 columns, but actually I need only a couple of them. I need track ID and user ID and date. And this table has grown to more than 25 terabytes of compressed data on disk since mid-February 2013. And I need to process this data starting from February 12, uh, 2013, because this was the first day when Spotify was launched in Poland. 
the next table is user and it contains information about user profiles. It also, uh, it has 40 columns, but I need only user ID and the country where a given user is registered. And this table uh, contains um, a little more than 10 gigabytes of compressed data on disk. So it's not that much, but probably uh, too much to read it fully into memory. And the last table is a uh, track. It contains metadata information about our tracks. It has only five columns, but actually one of them is big, big a JSON blob that contains many metadata information about tracks, including the artist name that I need to extract. And all those uh, Hive tables share a couple of common properties. They are stored as Avro files with our custom Avro 3D. They are compressed using deflate compression codec. They are partitioned by day, or in case of stream tables, by date and hour. And they are not bucketed, and they are not indexed. And let's have a look at my, uh, my query that I implemented. So basically, I need to take stream table, join it with track table on track ID, and user table on user ID, and I'm only interested in Timbuktu's tracks and Polish users. And I specify that I need to process streams between mid-February uh, 2013 and mid-April 2014. And I specify that, uh, that I want to take the recent metadata about tracks, the recent user profiles, and everything should be grouped by user ID, and for each unique user, I count the number of streams that later will be sorted in the standing order, and I take only top 100 biggest fans of Timbuktu, hoping that the, the biggest one would be me. And this, the implementation and the idea of this query is conceptually simple, but there is at least one place where I can make a, a mistake here. And this is probably the most important Hive query that I have implemented in my life, so I cannot make any mistake here. And although Timbuktu and Martin Lawrenson are not software engineers, I assume that they wouldn't accept the result of Hive query that haven't been tested. Therefore, I implemented unit tests for my uh, Hive query. And unit tests in Hive are not that easy as you might uh, want. And if you read a Hive book, you might probably have seen an exemplary implementation of uh, unit tests in Hive written in Java. And uh, this implement, uh, the implementation of unit tests in Java uh, for Hive is very tedious. You need to use uh, Hadoop and Java API. Your Java code needs to create uh, input files and expected output files. You need to do assertions on your own and many others. And the little problem with Java is that Hive analysts are not or don't want to be uh, Java developers. And the more tedious process of locally testing Hive queries is, the bigger temptation is not to test at all or test manually on the production cluster. And for those reasons, I implemented a B-test, which is very simple utility for uh, unit testing Hive queries locally uh, in high-level way. And a unit test in B-test uh, consists of a couple of files that are stored uh, in the same directory. And the, those files include a file that contains a query that you would like to test, uh, a file that contains a schema definitions of your tables, uh, the in text input files that should be loaded to those tables, also a file with your expected output, and optionally a script that will be executed at the beginning of your uh, test to do some initialization, for example, to speci specify values of configuration uh, settings or your parameters. And this is the example how uh, a file with definitions of the tables uh, looks like. And here I have three tables and, and I specify the headers of the tables, something that you typically uh, specify in your uh, create clause uh, when you create a tables in Hive. And B-Test will analyze this Mm, this file, it will parse it, and for each line, it will create a table with a given schema in local Hive database called B-Test. And then it will look for a text file with the same name as the name of the table, and it will load it into that table. And here I have some text files that will be loaded into those tables. I have three tracks, and two of them are 
uh, recorded by Timbuktu. I have three users, and two of them are from Poland, and I have five streams, uh, and three of them are from Polish users that listen to Timbuktu. And my expected output is that one user should have two streams and another user should have one stream. And to execute that test, I, uh, I type run test command with a path to a directory that contains all those files. And btest will uh, look at those files and it will create a, a bit larger Hive query that will uh, be executed locally, it will create a necessary tables, it will load the input data into those tables and execute the query that you want to test. And it should, should finish relatively fast, and then uh, the output of your query is compared to the expected output to make sure that the test passes. And in my case, the test passed, so the motto is be test, be happy. And so far, so good. My query works on, uh, uh, on testing data, but uh, to make sure that it's correct, we need to uh, execute it on a cluster to make sure that it works in fully distributed mode and also with configuration settings specified by our administrators. Uh, and first, I decided to, uh, to generate the sample of my tables. And Hive offers a table sample operator that can generate samples of your tables and it can sample at various granularity levels. Uh, when generating a sample, it can look at subset of your buckets, subset of your HDFS blocks, and first and records from each uh, input split. However, there are some limitations there because bucket sampling works only if you have bucket, uh, a bucketized table. HDFS block sampling, uh, uh, method uh, supports only combined input file format, but in my case, I'm using custom Avro format. So the only sampling method uh, that works for me is row sampling. However, the problem with table sample is that if I table sample a couple of tables independently, I don't have any guarantees that, uh, that my join operator will return any rows. So Table sample was not good for me, and I started looking for alternative methods of sampling that are available in different tools, like PIG, for example. And it turns out that PIG offers a couple of interesting sampling algorithms, and thanks to H catalog, you can integrate PIG and Hive, and PIG can be used, for example, to sample your Hive tables. And uh, one interesting algorithm that uh, PIG offers in data full library is called consistent sampling by a key. And this algorithm calculates a hash code on a given field, the user ID in this example, and then this hash code is converted into double precision number, and if this number is smaller that, than a given threshold, then this, this row is included into sample. And because of this algorithm is deterministic, you always get the same hash code on the same user ID, then uh, we have the guarantee that if, uh, if a given user is occurs in a two data sets and is included in the sample of one data set, then we have the guarantee that it would be included into uh, second data sets. So this is great because this gives me a guarantee that I will be able to apply join operators successfully after sampling. However, the problem with my query is that after generating a sample but before joining, I filter out many records because I'm only interested in Polish users and team back to tracks. So uh, because of that, I have no guarantee that actually any records will be passed after filtering to, to join. So the methods that I evaluated uh, were not perfect for me. So I started thinking what, what methods would be good enough. And I simply decided to use sample by a key algorithm to generate 1% of day's worth of data, hoping that it will, uh, it will be good enough. And the good news is that my Hive query uh, finished successfully. It even returned some Polish users listened to Timbuktu. However, my username was not included, and this was the bad news. So I was a bit worried that, uh, that my drinking session with Timbuktu will not happen, but, but I hope that on larger data set, uh, my username will appear. 
But before running my, da my query on larger data set, I, I spent some time uh, to fully under understand the execution of my query. And he, Hive offers explain operator that shows how, how Hive query is translated into MapReduce jobs. And this, uh, the output of explain is very useful, but a bit tricky to understand, at least at the beginning, because in my case, it generated more than 300 lines and many strange phases like uh, conditional operator, backup stage, map reduce, local work, and so on. And assuming the default settings, a my query would be executed as four map reduce jobs, where two of them are needed to perform the join operator of three tables. And I started thinking how to decrease the number of uh, of my uh, MapReduce jobs and how to join all those three tables in one MapReduce job. And actually, it's, it's possible uh, because Hive offers you possibility to run uh, a couple of map joins together in map phase of a single MapReduce job. And I was managed to decrease the number of MapReduce jobs in my query to two, and this is how the execution plan looks like. So let's briefly uh, analyze it. And uh, First, I forced Hive to, uh, to run uh, joins of all my tables in map phase of a single map reduce job by setting a configuration parameter, uh, Hive auto convert join non conditional size to a value that is bigger than file size of uh, combined file size of two tables. Uh, and uh, thanks to that, uh, Hive will assume that. Those tables will, will be a, that have will be able to load those tables into memory, and then uh, map task that will iterate over the largest data set will look for uh, for matches in memory, and and to start map join procedure, uh, first we'll run a task that is called local work, and in this task we'll read the records from small table from HDFS to build a hash table that would be later used by a uh, map task that will iterate over the largest data set. And uh, because this, those hash tables will be loaded into memory, Hive will measure how, how much memory is needed to, to load them. And if we, uh, if we consume more than 90% of a memory allocated to our map task, then uh, this process will be aborted and the query will not be submitted. However, if you have enough memory or small enough hash table, then uh, this hash table will be added to distributed cache, and your uh, map task will uh, read them, uh, will read them and use uh, use uh, during the uh, join. And this map join is very efficient because uh, we don't have any reduce task and a certain shuffle phase. However, there, it has some scalability limitations because your dim dimension tables can be too big to fit into memory or they can be too big to load the records uh, from the client, uh, from HDFS to client machine. And uh, after running a join, I will have to group my records by user ID and now Hive can uh, do grouping after joining in the same MapReduce job. And later, I would require one more MapReduce job to sort, uh, sort my records by account and, uh, and limit uh, to 100 top users. And after configuring my, uh, my query to run as uh, map-only joins and understanding how, how, how this query works, I started running it at scale. And running Hive query at scale is a completely different story than running Hive query locally or on sample data sets. And I quickly ran into some number of issues. And the first issue was that I haven't seen any progress of my uh, task during first half an hour. And it was caused by the fact that my dimension tables were too big to read them from a uh, to read them by a client from HDFS. And as a workaround, I had to implement a preprocessing step that, uh, that will generate the intermediate tables that will contain only the necessary record rows and columns that I really need during my join. So only Polish users, only Timbuktu tracks. And thanks to that, I was able to build hash tables very quickly at the cost of spending more than eight minutes to run uh, this preprocessing step that could be considered here as an investment because later I would use that table to uh, process terabytes of data. So the, the Hive allowed my query to, uh, to run on the cluster, but it quickly failed due to out-of-memory errors. And when analyzing the heap dump, 
of crashed map task, I discovered that uh, that Hive, actually MapReduce, uses the in-memory uh, map output buffer that always consumed allocated number of megabytes, regardless the number of intermediate key value pairs that are stored there. And in my case, I produce very little intermediate key value pairs because there are not so many Polish users listening to Spotify, so the compelling uh, listening to Timbuktu. So uh, the compelling fix is to uh, decrease the size of that buffer. And I prefer this, that solution over increasing the heap size of my map task because then I would require more cluster resources. So thanks to that fix, my query worked, but actually it was uh, two, three times slower than regular join. And it can be considered as an epic fail because I spent a whole evening to understand the execution plan of my query, to optimize memory setting, to configure it as map join. And it was even slower, even if I exclude uh, the overhead needed to prepare dimension tables. And when looking at counters, I discovered that my map join query runs into garbage collection issues because the ratio uh, CPU time to garbage collection time is, is very high. And to fix that, I actually had to give extra memory to my task. And thanks to that, my, uh, my Hive query finished. Uh, finish, uh, finish faster than the default one. And when thinking about traditional optimizations of my query, I reach the dead end very quickly because uh, in case of my query, the, the most heavy work is done in the map phase of the first map reduce job. And I fixed all garbage collection issues there and I started play playing with the uh, size of the input split for that task. I also started decreasing the number of reduced tasks uh, for other praises here to reduce the overhead of scheduling, uh, scheduling reduced tasks. I also played with, Uberization, with Uber tasks, but the best performance number that I achieved uh, was 50 minutes to process uh, two months of production data. And after processing this two months of production data, I discovered that I'm a person number 10. So it was, uh, the performance was bad, the, the my position was bad, and I decided that I will not spend any, any more time in my life to run very slow Hive queries, and I decided to introduce uh, major changes. And the first change was, uh, relates to a uh, columnar format called org that I wanted to use in my, uh, my query. And the main motivation here is that my Hive table is very wide. It contains more than 50 columns, but I only need to read two of, the, two of them from disk. So the columnar format is perfect fit, for, uh, fit here. And thanks to that, I would be able to read less data from HDFS, what would be great for my uh, map task, especially those which uh, run, uh, uh, especially those uh, which process remote blocks uh, from HDFS. However, the, the one disadvantage here was that I had to convert my av uh, terabytes of data from Avro to Orc. However, the good news is that Orc consumes less space than Avro. And here we have a diagram that shows uh, three pairs of uh, file format and compression codecs and their storage consumption. And it's it's definitely not the most fair comparison because I compare different compression codecs here, but one thing worth nothing, no, nothing is that uh, Snappy usually compress, compress lighter than deflate, but if you use Snappy with Arc, it compresses better than deflate with Avro. So it's, it's, it's very good. And those compression properties are very nice, but the, the thing that is the even more nicer is the amount of data that we read from HDFS. And in case of uh, ARC file compressed with uh, Zlib compression, I, I was reading order of magnitude less data from HDFS during processing my, uh, my data set. And obviously this, uh, this uh, translates to uh, big performance uh, improvements, both in terms uh, wall clock time and CPU execution time. And those numbers could be even better if I, uh, if I would decide to use snappy compression codec. But I haven't, uh, haven't decided to do so because uh, normally we would keep 
those data sets compressed by uh, Zlib because at Spotify we, we very often run out of disk space in our HDFS cluster. And the next thing that I wanted to try was Apache TESS. And when you talk about TESS, you might hear very often that TESS makes the computation very efficient because it removes the empty map tasks from your computation so you can run your queries as map, reduce, reduce, reduce. And also uh, another uh, advantage that is uh, often mentioned is that you don't need to write your intermediate data into HDFS after each reduce step. So those benefits are very important, but in case of my query, I was a bit skeptical because in my case, I have only two MapReduce jobs and everything uh, is uh, actually done in map phase of my first MapReduce job. I have very little intermediate data written to HDFS after the first MapReduce job. So I, I didn't expect a big, big performance improvement here, but I was wrong. And actually, TESS gave me very good, significant uh, performance gains both for Avro and ORC uh, file formats. And, uh, and at Spotify currently we run mo most, of our, uh, most of our computation using Avro and MapReduce. We use those technologies more often, but if we would switch to, Avro, uh, to TESS and ORC, only for this simple query we would see uh, almost one order of magnitude better performance, which is kind of great. And now I would like to briefly explain where those performance uh, benefits come from. So obviously we benefit a little from removing uh, empty map tasks and the necessity to write intermediate data to HDFS in case of my query. But another thing worth noting is that uh, my Hive query is executed on the cluster a single one distributed application. However, with MapReduce, this query would be executed as two MapReduce jobs that need to be submitted to the cluster one by one. So if the first MapReduce job is done, you might be unlucky and, if you, uh, and, if, and you can wait in a queue uh, for the cluster resources before submitting the, the second MapReduce job if, if your cluster is busy. And the, la the latency then, then would be higher. And apart from that, TESS is very smart when configuring the number of tasks, because instead of specifying the number of reduced tasks before submitting uh, the query, TESS can um, specify the number of those tasks dynamically, and it can decrease the number of reduced tasks when it sees that the amount of intermediate uh, data generated by, by map task is smaller than expected. And apart from that, TESS can also uh, specify when and how many reduced tasks should be pre launch before all map tasks are done. And in case of, in case of map tasks, uh, the number of, uh, of map tasks started is the product of many variables, including the, uh, the minimum and maximum limits for input splits, and also the queue capacity or the queue utilization uh, where your application is submitted to. And, but probably the, the feature that I benefited the most is uh, the container reuse. And I would like to explain it on this diagram that shows uh, the tasks run over the time on a given host. And uh, first of all, uh, because of we reuse the containers, we, we don't need to negotiate with resource managers so often. So thanks to that, we, because we have the container at the hand, uh, we, we get a very big benefits when the uh, cluster is congested or your queue has not so many available containers. And also the containers can run many different types of uh, tasks. And here we have a reduced task number three that was executed in the container that earlier was used by reduced task number two. And in MapReduce work, world, it would require starting new uh, new MapReduce job, and it will require submission uh, job to the cluster. And because the cost of reusing containers is, is very small, uh, as we don't spend time for creating and initializing JVM, uh, it's very compelling to start very thin map task to minimize the risk of having, uh, having stragglers that would slow down the whole job. And another cool thing is that uh, when we reuse containers, we also reuse the object cache 
uh, that is related to that container. And this object cache can share many uh, useful data that can be used by many tasks uh, running in our jobs. And, uh, and TESS uses uh, this object cache to store, for example, hash tables used during map joins. And uh, thanks to that, only the first task uh, loads this hash table and all remaining tasks running in the same JVM would simply reuse them and will finish very quickly. TESS also has the explain operator and the first thing that I notice is that uh, the output of, uh, of this explain operator is uh, shorter, simpler to understand and easier to follow. And the other interesting thing that I notice is that uh, is the existence of broadcast edge operator. And it turns out that TESS runs my joins as using broadcast join algorithm. And broadcast join is actually the improved version of map join. And the main difference is that TESS will start a uh, dedicated map task that will uh, build the hash tables on the cluster. And those map tasks will stream the parts of the hash tables to downstream tasks that will iterate over the largest data set and use them uh, for in-memory lookups. And thanks to the fact of building hash tables on the cluster, we have higher parallelism, we have better data locality, and we, have, we don't need to send uh, lots of data back and forth between our client machine and, uh, and HDFS. And I decided to run that first query that didn't make any progress on Hive during the first half an hour, and TESS managed to finish that in 11 minutes, which is kind of great. In, in, it increased the performance of the query and also developers' productivity because there is no need to add this uh, preprocessing step that will generate the intermediate table only with rows and columns that we need. And there, there are a couple of uh, memory-related benefits in TESS that I uh, that in Hive I run into, into issues related to them. And for example, TESS can automatically rescale the size of in-memory buffer for intermediate key value pairs, so it's not statically allocated uh, as in MapReduce. And also it reduces the memory footprint for the size of map join hash tables that are used in uh, map join. And when running uh, TESS, queries on large data sets, I discovered that sometimes test application master can be very busy because there is lots of internal communication. So to get good performance, make sure that, uh, that you log at, log at at least info level, that you give enough memory uh, to your application master, and you have good tools to troubleshoot uh, potential issues. And another features, a feature that I wanted to try is vectorization that allows you to process a data in a batch of 1,024 uh, rows instead of processing one row at a time. And this feature reduced the CPU usage and it's supported by ARC and scales very well, uh, especially for larger data sets that I, uh, I have noticed. And in my case, the uh, I get the benefits of vectorization when I analyze my full data sets. But when I analyze the smaller data set, uh, I notice that non-vectorized query uh, uh, gives me better performance numbers. And this is probably related to the fact that uh, vectorized map join is not yet fully supported because it, it gives some benefits of vectorization, but also it has a cost. And the cost is that in some places of the code, we switch from vectorized mode to row mode, and we process uh, rows uh, one row at the time. However, uh, we still have some benefits of vectorization that uh, that are uh, that we we have better memory consumption. We we have better uh, use to memory to CPU bandwidth. So, in in case of my largest data sets, those benefits were bigger than the cost of switching from. Uh, vectorized to row mode uh, from time to time. And anyway, uh, this implementation will change and it will be improved by the community soon. And the lesson that I learned with vectorization is to make uh, that it's always worth to make sure that uh, this, uh, this feature is fully or partially supported for your query because there are still new operators and data sets added to, uh, to vectorization and uh, and run simply your bank benchmarks and profilers to check uh, what, uh, what parts of code you are executing. 
And the last feature that I wanted to try are table statistics. And table statistics allows you to collect statistics at table, partition, and column levels. And those statistics can be later used by R, R file format and test to generate uh, optimal query plan. And when using the table statistics, uh, tests decrease the number of map tasks in my query. And thanks to that, uh, my query finished successfully. So uh, it was a good decision. And I was able to finish a whole query on uh, my full data set that consists of 14, 14 months in little more than 10 minutes. Uh, so this was the best performance number that I achieved. Obviously, I, I could try more features. I can use snappy compression codec uh, and so on. But this was uh, good enough for me because, uh, because if I'm the biggest fan of Timbuktu, I would be able to prove it to him during our drinking session. So now I would like to officially tell who is the, the biggest fan of Timbuktu in Poland. And it turns out that this person is Adam Kawa. Uh, and this is everything that I have uh, for you. And the, the conclusion is that the deals at 5 a.m might be a very good idea. So try at least once. And, uh, and also, now Hive becomes very fast. And it's, it might be a single solution for all Hive queries running on the Hadoop cluster, both for interactive and batch queries, regardless of the data size. And TESS actually becomes uh, MapReduce version 1 because it's very flexible, it's smart, it improves what was inefficient with MapReduce, uh, MapReduce framework. And it's also easy to deploy. So I, I deployed a couple of Hadoop clusters in my career, and I can, uh, I can say that probably the only one tool that is easier to deploy is Apache Pig. But the next one is probably test, so I highly recommend you to try. And I would like to give special thanks uh, to Gopal who, for answering uh, many technical answers about tests and also for installation scripts that I used. So those scripts are very great. They build test and hive from trunk. Uh, so you get the, the, the most recent features available there. And also uh, special thanks to my colleagues at Spotify for technical review of this presentation and feedback. And we have three minutes left, so I'm, I'm open for questions. Yes, there is a question. Uh, you, sorry. The, uh, the size of uh, in intermediate uh, map uh, map buffer, right? And uh -huh. so, uh, to be honest, I. I have no knowledge how it's actually done, and I haven't measured the performance gains here. I, I just only get this information from uh, from a uh, test committer. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have a question that uh, when you mentioned that uh, before the test, you uh, try to build the the hive, try to build the hash table run out of memory, so you have to pre-process data. Even though your query only need uh, several columns, but because the table has a lot of columns, mm -hmm. I wonder if that's the shortcoming of the Hive itself or the Avron, because you use Avron. If you use the ORC file, ORC file, you you probably don't need that. Uh, uh, yes, yes, exactly. So if you if you build uh, hash tables uh, from the data that is stored in ORC file, then uh, then you then ORC reader can only touch the disk to read uh, necessary columns. So uh, so mm, I, I would be able to build those hash tables on ARC uh, faster. Uh, however, mm, however, the numbers that I showed uh, shows the, mm, uh, the performance of the framework as a whole from the beginning to the end. So I didn't want to, to optimize only uh, part of the data set to make sure that, uh, that Avro works better. Thank you. Yes? I noticed that you decided to use Zlib, and it sounds like maybe you're doing that across Spotify as a standard. I'm wondering how do you choose which 
uh, codec to use across your enterprise? Is it is it each one goes by use case? You have to pick, or how did you select your your type of compression? Uh, how do we select the compression codec for our case? Yes, so that you mm -hmm. whether it's splittable or not, or more compression, you mm -hmm. do it at an enterprise level or a use case level. Yes. Yeah, so right now we uh, we do that in a very simple way because we we usually try to use the most uh, efficient compression codec because at Spotify we always grow our cluster because of we because we running out of disk space. So the heaviest compression, the better for us. And there there are also some uh, some restrictions. For example, if you produce According to my knowledge, if you produce uh, the output data in PIG uh, in Avro format, then you have only two compression codecs available, Avro and Snappy. So, uh, so in that case, we use uh, uh, so, uh, sorry. So you have compression codecs Avro and Deflate, and in that case, we, we use Deflate because uh, it's uh, it compresses heavier. So, uh, so in our in our case, for permanent storage, we, we usually pick the heavier compression codecs, but for intermediate storage, for intermediate key value pairs, we, we use typically snappy.